Dr. Ted Brodkin and Ashley Palathra. Welcome to Shrink Wrap Radio. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Thanks for having us. Well, it's great to have you two here. And um, it's going to be my pleasure to speak to you about your work together and particularly your 2021 book just came out, I guess. Is it on the shelves yet? Mm-hmm. Yeah. On the shelves came out in January. Yeah. Missing each other, how to cultivate meaningful connections. And if ever that were timely, it's certainly timely <laughs> now. And we'll be talking about that. Well, your book starts off with a with a story, kind of an anecdote about the Dalai Lama. And I think it'd be great to kick off with that same story, if you don't mind repeating it here. Sure. Um, so the story is that, um, I'm trying to remember the exact story now. So um, basically, Bob Thurman, Robert Thurman, who's a professor of Indo-Tibetan Buddhist studies at Columbia and a friend of the Dalai Lama. And the father um, of Uma Thurman, I should mention. Right, right. That's oh. <laughs> probably what makes him most famous, right? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, but he was giving a lecture somewhere about Buddhism. And, um, you know, he's known to be close to the Dalai Lama. So someone in the audience raised their hand and said, um, have you ever seen the Dalai Lama perform a miracle? Uh, with, with that person asked it with a lot of anticipation, like they wanted to hear something really yeah. wild that the Dalai Lama was able to do. And uh, Professor Thurman sort of hesitated because he, he felt like he'd seen some remarkable things happen around, around the Dalai Lama, but he wasn't sure what he should say. And then his wife, who was also there, stepped right in and she said, I've seen him perform plenty of miracles. And then Bob Thurman said he kind of looked at his wife like, what is she going to say? And, and she said, um, you know, the Dalai Lama is a very busy man. And he goes to all kinds of meetings with many, many people. But every single time I've seen him talk to someone, he was completely attentive to them and completely tuned in. And that's really a miracle. And the person who asked the question apparently looked a little bit disappointed because he was expecting, you know, something about levitation or something like that. Right. Yeah. But, you know, but we go on to say that in a sense, it really is miraculous because it's so challenging to really tune in and pay attention to each other, especially these days with all the distractions and sure. all the things going on. Oh yeah. It's, it really, uh, it really requires major effort I find. And sometimes I'm a little embarrassed, you know, to call myself a, a, a trained psychotherapist or psychologist uh, because I'm aware of how much my mind drifts away. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so your book really gets us into that. And it's interesting that it comes out of years of research that the two of you have been involved in uh, studying uh, uh, both doing research and treatment of individuals on the, uh, on the, uh, on the autistic spectrum blocking on Mm -hmm. it. And uh, that seems kind of surprising. What's the connection there? How do you get from, uh, from that research to, Uh, talking about attunement. Yeah, that was, I think, the most interesting thing that came out of that research that we did together. So that was a um, clinical research study where, you know, we were developing supports for autistic adults to strengthen their social functioning skills. You know, a lot of these adults, they had no intellectual disability. They were really you know, fairly quote unquote high functioning, had jobs, were in college, married with families, but we're really hoping to work on ways to connect with other people. And, you know, whether it's their personal relationships or trying to strengthen their ability to just succeed generally in life. And throughout that program, what we did were develop these different sets of exercises and clinical interventions to help assist those individuals to strengthen those skills. And over time, what we realized were a lot of the skills that we were trying to strengthen were things that, you know, I think a lot of people want to work on in different ways, whether you're on the spectrum or not ways to just be able to connect and feel in tune with other people. You know, I think a lot of um, interventions and programs for people on the autism spectrum will really target individual skills like conversation skills or how do I enter a group or how do I 
place a call or, or make a voicemail skills that are really important. But at the end of the day, you know, I think that feeling that we get when we feel really in sync with someone is more of an elevated, um, you know, overarching form of connection. And, and we realize with, you know, the rates of loneliness going up and the difficulties that all people have been facing with connection, you know, there was something there that we thought might resonate with a broader population. Yeah, that's an interesting thing about uh, taking a research approach is that you force yourselves to really break down and look at the sort of micro steps, if you will, mm -hmm. the, the components that we sort of take for granted and assume that we all know how to do. But in fact, uh, many of us, myself included, uh, feel socially awkward at times. And, uh, and, and yeah, so... Uh, just doing these podcasts has been a good exercise for me in terms of uh, establishing relationship, short-term relationships with strangers. And in some ways, it's easier, I think, than face-to-face. -face. <laughs> but um, so, uh, so really, your book talks a lot about attunement. That's the word. And attunement is one that... Uh, I'm familiar with from, uh, I think, from meditation research and so on. Uh, but what do you mean by attunement? Can you define attunement for us? Yeah, um, attun by attunement, we mean an ability to be aware of and in tune with yourself, as well as aware of and in tune with another person and what's happening between you over the course of an interaction, over the twists and turns, sometimes unpredictable twists and turns of an interaction. So trying to stay connected um, with that other person. That's you know, basically what it means. Yeah, um, talking about being aware of the other person puts me in mind, and I'm not sure if you use this term in the book, a theory of mind, but, mm -hmm. but the, the assertion that uh, often people who are on the spectrum don't seem to have that, quotes, theory of mind, that awareness that, okay, that's a person over there much like myself. They have an internal world just like I do. Is that what we're talking about? Yeah, I think, um, I think that's part of it. I, in, uh, we break down attunement into parts, and one of the parts that we talk about is um, what we call understanding, like understanding another person, understanding yourself. And that idea of theory of mind is part of that understanding. So okay. basically perspective taking, imagining things from the other person's perspective versus your own perspective and realizing that there may be differences between your two perspectives. Okay. Now this may seem obvious, but why is attunement important? Why should we be interested in that? I mean... I think all of us from as soon as we're born crave connection and crave um, social interaction and engagement. You know, at birth, we need it in terms of survival. Yeah. As we yeah. get older, we crave it, you know, in terms of um, our mental well being and just generally our ability to feed off of those connections is huge. And so, you know, I, I think especially in this last year, or I guess now two years almost of this pandemic, we've really started to, to see that globally, whether or not you had challenges with loneliness or disconnection prior to the pandemic, now it's become this universal um, experience that we've yes. all felt disconnected in some way and, and, and realized the value of it in our lives. One of the things that I've become aware of in myself, and I've heard other people speak about it, is having been disconnected now for a year and a half or more, um, it can be hard to uh, kick oneself in, back into gear to, to uh, you know, like, okay, I've survived for a year and a half more or less on my own in my little family pod, and... Um, Maybe I don't need to, you know. Maybe I don't need to go out and face the challenges of dealing with actual people <laughs> face to face again. Yeah, I saw a New Yorker cartoon about that recently on on Instagram, where it was like it was a couple. I think they were kind of laying next to each other in bed, and one of them had, I think, the woman had a list of 
she was going through with the pen and she's like, okay, I'm going through the list of all the people who were in our lives who re really don't need to get back in our lives now, you know, after yeah. the pandemic. Um, yeah. Yeah. I yeah, think, I, I, I'm a, yeah. a New Yorker subscriber as well. And I remember that cartoon. <laughs> oh, you do. Yeah. 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 It was funny. Um, I think one thing that we talk about a lot in the book um, in terms of the need for connection is an idea of the need, some need for balance. We all need connection and we all need space to ourselves. Sometimes when I've given talks to students at university of Pennsylvania, I've said to take two extreme examples, um, you know, the worst punishment perhaps you could do to someone is put them in solitary confinement, right? In a prison yeah. where they never have any contact with any other person. Cause we have a fundamental need for contact with other people. But on the other hand, if you imagine if, if you've ever been in Manhattan during rush hour and gotten yeah. on a subway where you're crammed in like sardines with all these strangers, there's nothing you want more than just to have some space to yourself. Right. So, yeah. so those are two extremes, but the, um, we need some sort of balance between connectedness and space to ourselves. And that's something that we talk about quite a bit in the book. Yeah. You also talk about the impact of technology on attunement. And uh, I found that very fascinating because I've long been sort of a technophile, a, re a reflexive technophile. Um, but then as time has gone on, I've become aware of the uh, dark underbelly of, uh, of that. You guys uh, are at the University of Pennsylvania, and I'm just remembering, I was originally accepted into the program in electrical engineering at, uh, at, uh, the, at Penn. And uh, I, sw I switched out pretty early, actually, <laughs> discovered that, oh, I'm not sure that's me. But, um, but yeah, so, so that interest and, and a certain facility for technology has always been with me, but it's definitely uh, a, a, a two-faced thing. Uh, so talk to us about that. What, what are your concerns about technology and its impact on attunement? Do you want to start off, Ashley? I and mean, I can add something if you want. Uh, why don't you go ahead? Okay, sure. Yeah, I mean, we do talk a lot about technology in the book because, I mean, after all, we're we're living in the age of technology, right? I mean, this is what most of us um, spend a lot of time with our devices. And so, in the early part of the book, we talk about the ways in which the, the double-edged sword of technology that in some ways it has connected us. We can find old high school classmates on Facebook and we can be connected with people all over the world in a way that just wasn't possible before. But on the other hand, um, we can be so engrossed in our devices, so distracted by what's coming from our devices and checking things on our devices that we don't pay all that much attention to the people who are right next to us. Um, and so it really, it's really a mixed bag. And there's been a lot of concerns expressed about the idea that even though theoretically social media, for example, connects us, there are many people who feel more distressed when they spend a lot of time on social media and more lonely in some ways. They see all the supposedly wonderful things that other people are doing and parties they're throwing that don't include right. them. Or, you know, for younger people like in high school, you know, you thought you were in some friend group and then you see a bunch of these people who are supposed to be your friends doing something together and you weren't invited or whatever it was. I mean, there are ways in which you can actually amplify uh, loneliness. And some people, there was an editorial in the New York Times just a couple of days ago that Ashley and I were talking about that um, argues that the rise of social media, when social media becoming really prevalent in around 2012 correlates really well with a rise in loneliness and depressed depression in, in teens and like Generation Z. Oh, yeah. So that's, I mean, that's part of what we talk about early in the book. And then we talk about it more later on, which we can get into if you want. Yeah, yeah, we, we may touch back on that uh, as we move along. And uh, yeah, I know I'm particularly concerned about uh, the impact on, on young people. And I've got grandkids and uh, I've got a, a grandkid who recently moved into having an iPhone with a parent's permission. And, uh, but I also have uh, 
people in her parents' uh, generation, our kids, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, and sometimes they also uh, it seems so rude to people of my generation when you're hanging out together and the person is constantly looking at their phone. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes it gets under our skin and uh, I'll say, uh, who else is with us here? You know, who else are we talking to? <laughs> the whole world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it, because it becomes so habitual that checking, checking mm -hmm. uh, of, with the email and for the young people, checking with friends, just being the need to be connected, particularly during this pandemic. I, I have to remind myself to be compassionate about that because they're being deprived of, of uh, the natural connectedness that would be part of their life stage that they're in right now. And so, of course, they're going to turn to whatever means they have available to try to achieve that. Um, you also talk about uh, the neuroscience of all of this and um, and and one of the major topics as well. I'll come back to the to the neuroscience, but uh, uh, mindfulness in relation to attunement. Let's talk about that because I've joked that we're in the midst of a mindfulness bubble. Become mindfulness is suddenly everywhere. And mm -hmm. uh, but but tell us about your take on mindfulness in relation to to your book and attunement. It's definitely related. Mindfulness is absolutely encompassed within attunement. I'd say, you know, I definitely agree. Mindfulness is, has been co-opted in some ways to really just be splattered everywhere. Uh, yeah, you know, you yeah. can be mindful about eating or mindful just about your own breath or your body. Um, I think it's a part of attunement. Attunement takes you know what we consider the foundation of attunement is something called relaxed awareness which includes this mindfulness about yourself and and being present and in the moment but there's a little bit more of a dynamic aspect to attunement where you're really trying to focus on the balance between being mindful of yourself and how you're physically feeling and how you're thinking um, and emotionally feeling but also aware of your environment. So there's this um, duality to it where you're really trying to stay relaxed, yet at the same time focused and present in the moment. And that can be extremely difficult to do for longer periods of time. Yeah, it's a, like just the process of being mindful solo, sitting on your meditation cushion or whatever is challenging enough, but now you're bringing into a, a social a social dimension mm -hmm. where not right. only do I need to be mindful of what's going on in me, but mindful of this other person. So exactly. So that's why, you know, when we talk through the book, we, we talk about a lot of different ways that you can practice some of these skills. And so one of the first tips that we usually recommend is to practice yourself to focus on, you know, your breath, we describe sort of sitting meditation within the book that you can do by yourself anywhere. But, you know, I think what's unique about our book is that we then talk about how you can use those skills and practice them with other people, because it's hard to go from zero to 100. Uh, without that uh, practice. It's like a muscle that you have to strengthen over time and be able to to learn how to practice or balance your awareness across so many different things. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the exercises. Actually, there are a number of exercises in the book that progressively, uh, that, that I think are built on the, the research that you did. And um, one of the questions I wanted to ask you was, well, how do you know they work? These, you know, people will put exercises in a book and maybe they just dreamed them up out of their head. Uh, how do you know these? Why is it going to be worth it, the, the reader's time and energy to engage in these exercises? How do you know they work? That's a fair question. Um, I mean, part of our research, as you mentioned, is using these exercises. And we had a, a research study um, funded by NIMH where we had participants, these were participants who were on the autism spectrum, but do these exercises and we had pre post measures of social functioning and we, we've gotten some promising results in a pilot study and now we are um, 
following that up with a randomized control trial. Um, so, so we have some sort of traditional academic evidence to suggest that they work. But beyond that, um, you know, the book is not confined to our own research. We're really reviewing research from around the world. So many other people, there's been an awful lot of research done on mindfulness, for example. Um, so that foundational component of attunement. So we have a chapter on relaxed awareness, which we consider this foundational component of attunement. And we have relaxed awareness exercises. And many of these exercises are basically traditional mindfulness exercises, sitting meditation, walking meditation. And there are thousands and thousands of article, research articles now on benefits of mindfulness um, in various ways in terms of people's attention, their focus, various neurobiological effects and so on. So, so some of the evidence that I would point to is just evidence from the wider research literature. Um, and then some of the evidence is also just at the level of our own personal experience. Like we've, we've done these ourselves. Yeah. Um, we've, we, you know, we, we, you know, so we're not just looking at research participants or making stuff up, but the, this is stuff that we've, so Ashley and I each have our own kind of mindfulness practices. And I've, I'm a real enthusiast of Tai Chi. Some of the exercises in the book are derived from um, Tai Chi and Ashley has done some martial arts as well. And what we have personally noticed in ourselves, as well as fellow classmates in some of these classes is some really interesting and remarkable changes. And um, what's interesting to me about Tai Chi is that it seems like it has within it almost like a progressive curriculum for developing attunement. So, so paralleling what we present in the book, you start by learning to tune into your own body and your posture and your breath and so on. Then you learn to carry out these mindful movements that are tight, what people traditionally think of as Tai Chi. And then at a later stage, you develop um, a kind of interpersonal awareness and attunement by carrying out these things called push hands exercises. And, and you know, it's measurable and it's noticeable that you can get better at these things over time, the more you practice them. Um, and it's, you know, another way to think of it too, not to go on too long about this is, is learning a musical instrument. You know, that's another, uh, another really good example of attunement is playing music together or playing a sport together and yeah. through, through practice um, starting with your own individual practice of learning to be oriented to the instrument, developing a skill at playing it. And then ultimately getting to a place where you're good enough at that instrument that you can play together with another person who's also playing an instrument. And you can have this kind of attunement between you where you are aware of what you're doing, what you're playing, you're aware of what they're playing and you're able to do it in sync and in tune over time to create music together. And, and we just know it, it works by practicing. So, um, and I, well, one last comment I would say about the exercises is that there are a lot of exercises we present in the book. We don't think most people are gonna have time to do all of these exercises. So um, basically what we've provided <laughs> is a kind of a menu of options and people can try them out, pick and choose what they feel like works well for them. And also we have in the book, uh, what we call an attunement quiz where you can fill out a questionnaire and, and we're hoping that these questions help you get a sense of like, where, where might you need to focus your efforts yeah. uh, to try to yeah. get better at this? So to try to focus yeah. that. Yeah. Well, I can really relate to everything you, you've just gone through. Uh, having studied Tai Chi for a period of time myself and uh, uh, been in martial arts. I, I did sport judo for uh, a long time as well till I got injured. <laughs> oh. and, um, and, and then being a sort of a beginning musician for much of my life, but having had that moment where it was possible to then make music with others. And it's such a blissful mm -hmm. feeling when, when you can do that. When, for me, that's been the most dramatic, I think, as I think about it now, that sense of, uh, of connection that, that you can get making music with, uh, with others. It's a really yeah, high real, feeling. There's some real beauty in that, that you feel and that I think people witness as a result. Yeah, yeah. 
I was studying recorder at one one point, you know, the flute recorder, mm -hmm. and, not the tape recorder, <laughs> and and uh, and the teacher put us in a group and and uh, brought in some some other uh, baroque instruments, a harpsichord and and I think uh, an oboe or something, and and I was I broke out in laughter. I I. It, I felt so much joy that I started laughing in the middle of it. It just, um, I couldn't believe it. I'm here and I'm making this music with these other people. It was such a, a wonderful feeling. Yeah, and, I think uh, that's a great example, uh, David. I think that's, I mean, that's what we're trying to get at with this whole idea of attunement, that there can be this kind of in syncness and resonance that's reciprocal. It's going back and forth between you and the other person, or maybe yeah. several other people. And there, there is a kind of, when it works well, there, there's a euphoria to it. Um, mm -hmm. That's part of the reason I think we find this topic so intriguing. Well, I guess, I guess similarly too, th bringing it to the uh, interpersonal thing of two people being in relationship with each other, maybe having a wonderful conversation with your best friend, or when mm -hmm. you think about the people who are you really your closest friends, there's something there that you experience as very mutually reinforcing, so that you're both energized and excited to uh, to be in one another's presence. Yeah, yeah, I think most people have felt, you know, hopefully lucky enough to have that moment where you just feel yeah. and think and you feel like you see each other and you get each other. I'd say that's frequently or can more frequently occur with people that you have intimate relationships with. But absolutely, I'm sure there's people who have felt that with people they've just met. Maybe you felt it yeah. on some of your podcast interviews have, where you yeah. just sort of just, you know, you feel like you've known yeah. each other and you yeah. connect in that way. Yes, very much so. Um, tell us a little bit about the the, uh, the neuroscience. You do talk about mirror neurons, so maybe you can talk about that. And if if there are places beyond that uh, that the current research has gone, uh, let's sprinkle that in here. Sure. Um, well, as we go through these, what we call these four pillars or four components of attunement. Yeah we talk a little bit about the neuroscience of, of each of them. So, um, and I think we, we focus a little bit more on the first two components. I mean, I'll say with the, the four components, we've Good. mentioned some of these already, are number one, relaxed awareness, which we've mentioned as a kind of foundational state of mind and body for attunement. Number two is listening. And um, by listening, we don't mean just with our ears, but taking in all the cues from the other person Number three is understanding. So it's um, cognitively processing all these cues that we're taking in from the other person, trying to understand them. As you mentioned, theory of mind, taking, trying to imagine the other person's perspective and so on and really understand that. And then number four component of attunement is what we call mutual responsiveness. So that's the active component, like what you actually do towards the other person. So that involves what we call meeting the other person where they are, having a back and forth give and take, what we call contingent responsiveness, and trying to stay in the flow of the interaction with them. So getting to neuroscience, um, I think most, most of the neuroscience of this has really been done on the first two components, the relaxed awareness and the listening. Um, and, and, and understanding. I think less is known about mutual responsiveness. I think that's, there's a lot left to be learned about these kinds of things. But um, maybe I'll, I'll start us off with relaxed awareness. And maybe Ashley would want to jump in if you let me know, mm -hmm. Ashley, with some of the later ones. Yeah. But like, with relaxed awareness, we, in terms of the neuroscience, we spend time talking about um, both attention and stress. And um, we talk quite a bit about the autonomic nervous system. So, you know, we have a component of our nervous system that deals with the automatic functions of our body that we don't give a second thought to, right? Like our heart beating and our digestive functions and so on. 
And many people may be familiar with this already, but the autonomic nervous system has these two branches, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. So the sympathetic is our way of responding to stress and emergencies. So it's the fight, flight, or freeze response when something scary happens. You know, a lion walks in the room and all of a sudden you're ready to flee or, you know, fight or whatever you need to do. And then on the other side is the parasympathetic nervous system. That's more of the um, relaxation, um, maintenance of our body, and also connection. A lot of connection happens when we're in a more relaxed state. So we talk about the balance between those two and the idea that for many of us, um, we are tilted more towards stress and the activation of the sympathetic nervous system. And we're really evolved in such a way that the, the sympathetic nervous system and the fight, flight, or freeze response was meant for sudden emergencies that we quickly have to respond to, and then they're over and we make it to safety. So the, the stereotypical example of like the zebra and then the lion shows up and the zebra has got to get out of there. And once the zebra is able to make it away, they can relax again and their sympathetic nervous system can calm down. But the problem for us in our modern way of living is that we're often it feels like held in a chronic state of stress and sympathetic overload. You know, when we're hearing about the latest news about a surge in COVID or um, something terrible happens in the news and someone's murdered on TV or, you know, our job is in jeopardy or whatever it is, we're, we're in this chronic stress state. And many of us don't know how to get out of that or how to activate our parasympathetic nervous system and to relax again. And there's been a lot of research showing that being more relaxed, developing the state of relaxed awareness really helps you to connect. So that's some of the neuroscience that we go into with regard to that. Yeah. yeah, I'll just add that the second component too for listening, you know, just generally listening, I think is a type of resonance as well. When you are, you know, really listening with your whole body, you're not just listening and hearing the words that someone is saying, but you're also trying to, you know, take in all of the cues, like Ted was saying, hearing the tone of their voice, the cadence of their speech. Uh, noticing their body language, how they might be moving or fidgeting. And in some ways, I think when we're really open and listening to people, you also often notice if you uh, observe yourself that we sometimes resonate with them or we'll sometimes mirror them physically, like their our body language might mirror them. We might be nodding in the same cadence as them. Um, you know, our tone of voice, our emotional empathy sort of gets into high gear. And, and research wise, you know, we talk a little bit about the way that your brain activity synchronizes with that of the other person as well, when you're really listening to them quite closely. Yeah. And of course, a lot of this is, is also covered and very relevant for, in the training of psychotherapists, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of focus there in terms of research on psychotherapy and how to train psychotherapists. So that's of paramount importance is to be able to connect with one's clients and mm -hmm. to have as deep a connection as, as one can. And I'm a whole other realm is escaping. I'm losing the vocabulary and, and and all for it, but you may be aware of it. The the, the heart as part of the parasympathetic uh, nervous system. Yeah. The heart rate variability. Is that, is that what you're Yeah. Heart to? rate va variability in that whole system. Then there's a word I'm blocking on in relation to that. Um, but that's okay. I've covered it in other other interviews that's come up. Um, so we had talked about going back to technology, perhaps uh, in the end of the book, you spend a lot of time talking about artificial intelligence and uh, artificial intelligence is very with us these days in ways that, ways that we're not always aware of even. Um, so take us through that. And why is that important in this discussion? Yeah, um, as, as we mentioned before, we're living through this age of technology. We're in the 21st century, we're in this kind of exponential growth of artificial intelligence. And the things that artificial intelligence is able to do 
are becoming really astounding. You know, um, there are particular artificial intelligence or software programs that have beaten the best chess player and the, beaten the best alpha go player. Um, and these artificial intelligence programs train themselves to do that in a day, <laughs> you know, <laughs> through, through their own practice millions of times that they can iterate. So it's really um, astounding. And, and another thing that artificial intelligence is becoming able to do or is able to do is to do things that relate to social cognition, uh, social intelligence. So things like recognizing faces. I think a lot of people have heard in the news about facial recognition technology and how this is being used by law enforcement and controversies about this. And, um, you know, there are programs now that can pick out an individual face and distinguish it from millions of other faces. Yeah, so, amazing. so artificial intelligence can do things like recognizing faces. There, there's a whole field that's been growing over the past couple of decades of what's called affective computing. So in other words, computers and artificial intelligence programs becoming able to recognize emotions from facial expressions or tone of voice and so on. And some large technology companies like Facebook and others have become interested and perhaps have even taken out patents on using some of this affective computing type of AI. So, um, you know, the idea that you could be potentially scrolling your Facebook feed and while you're scrolling, Facebook through your computer is monitoring your facial emotion, emotional reactions to um, your, your feed. I don't, as far as I know, that's not happening yet, but I believe that they have a patent to do that. And then there's the development of robotics and people are making increasingly human-like appearing ro robots. Um, and then also robots that are programmed with this kind of ability to pick up on your emotions and also respond in a human-like way to your emotions. Yeah. So, so more and more technology is being used to simulate human attunement and is in some ways coming between human to human relationships as we you know as we become more and more preoccupied with our devices and our devices are used to mediate between us so much so much of what we do is electronic communication that we just thought it's important to raise this and to um to for people to be aware of it for us to have an ethical debate about, you know, what are the upsides uh -huh. of this? How can it help us? But how could it be potentially misused or even, you know, get, get in the midst of our most personal uh, relationships and most personal aspects of our lives? Yeah, yeah. The, you talking about the effective computing and uh, the place that I'm most aware of that is in relation to uh, one of the hats I've worn for uh, my career is a market researcher, market research consultant, mm -hmm. a focus group uh, facilitator, and one of, and that's made an entry into that profession of companies that market uh, effective uh, software to uh, while a person's watching an ad, for example, and will measure uh, their level of attentiveness their level of, uh, of engagement, their level of positive or negative emotion, evaluation, and so on. Mm -hmm. And um, I think they make claims, personally, I think they make claims that go beyond what they can actually do. But uh, they make big claims and they make big bucks. <laughs> yeah, that data is some of the most valuable out there. Yeah, yeah. So the world is changing so rapidly. And and I guess, the, as you suggest, that as citizens, we really need to be aware of some of these things and, and trying to, uh, it feels like a real uphill battle to get legislators and other people to uh, to, you know, to look at the, the ethics of uh, these technologies and so on. Um, you guys are at the University of Pennsylvania, and so I wonder if you're uh, if you identify with the positive psychology movement since that's kind of originated there at Penn. 
Um, one, one clarification, um, I'm still at University of Pennsylvania. Ashley did her um, college degree at Penn and also spent a few years working with me at Penn, but now Ashley's a graduate student at the Catholic University of America, a PhD um, doctoral candidate, uh, just to <laughs> make that okay. small clarification. Yeah. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm quite aware of the positive psychology group at Penn. And I, I've sat in on some of their seminars. I, I really like a lot of the work they do. In fact, um, Professor Angela Duckworth, who I think came out of that tradition, I don't know that mm -hmm. she is still completely involved in that, but um, she gave a lovely endorsement to our book, which I really appreciated. Oh, and, yeah. Um, yeah, and I think that, um, you know, what we're studying here, attunement and, and connection, you could say broadly falls under this concept of positive psychology in the sense that it has to do with positive functions. It, it's not just focused on mental illness and disease mm -hmm. and deficits, but it's, it's focused on um, a kind of flourishing that if we, right. if we can, um, if we can develop and enhance our capacity, our inherent capacity to connect with each other, that that can make our lives better. Yeah. Well, as, as we move towards wrapping this up, I'm, I'm thinking again about the pandemic, and we are now in what's being called the fourth wave of, of the pandemic, what with the Delta virus and uh, uh, our variant. Um, what advice would you have for people in terms of flourishing <laughs> and connecting during the pandemic? I'd say, you know, at this point, number one is safety, where you're protecting yourself and your family and your loved ones as you see best fit in terms of, you know, using social distancing, or I should say physical distancing when appropriate. But I think there, you know, as we've seen in the last year and a half, there are definitely ways that we can still connect. We can still maintain those connections and finding some unique alternatives around that. I think a lot of the skills that we talk about within this book have been become very relevant for difficult conversations that people have been having around getting the vaccine, for example, or just the conversations mm -hmm. that we have to navigate now that we're in this, these awkward transition periods of some people wearing masks, some people not, some people not knowing what people's comfort level are with different level protocols. Um, so, you know, being compassionate with yourself, but also with others, I think is first and foremost in order to facilitate some of those difficult conversations as well. Yeah, I really appreciate your highlighting the difficult conversations because you're right. We are uh, we find ourselves in in that place, and and uh, it's very challenging. Ted, anything you want to add to that? Well, in a sense, I want. I was thinking of adding something that Ash may know more about, which is. Uh, you know, part of what Ashley's been studying in graduate school is resilience. And I think um, it's not exactly what our book is about, but um, some aspects of it may be related. But I was thinking, you know, this being in this pandemic and the multiple waves of it and how long it's going on really has been a kind of maximal test of our own resilience and endurance. Um, so I was, you know, thinking of, I don't know if you want to say anything about that, Ashley, about the concept of resilience and ways well, to I'll develop it's, it. Yeah. It's definitely re relevant to the attunement skills that we've talked about in the way that it's malleable. I think a lot of people sometimes think that resilience is something that you have or you don't have, but it encompasses so many different skills of being adaptable and flexible and you know, have the capacity to lean on your social connections when necessary and when appropriate. And so I, you know, like Ted was saying, this has been a marathon and we have to, to realize when we can use these different skills at different times, but also being really aware and mindful of when you need to refill your tank in certain ways and however mm -hmm. that might look for different people. Because when we're running on empty, that's not good for ourselves or for the people around us that we're trying to right. take care of. It's sort of that metaphor of the oxygen mask where you put that on yourself first before you can help out other people. 
Yeah, and um, if one, one other thought is, um, I feel like the pandemic, you know, we need that kind of resilience that Ashley's talking about, and we need to lean on our social networks. And, and also at a, at a larger scale, I feel like um, the pandemic is, is an example of a large scale, really a global problem where an ability to communicate and work together with each other and listen to each other um, is part of the key to really addressing this. So for example, when it comes to vaccination, getting the message out, how can we best protect ourselves? How can we work together? How can we listen to each other? Um, you know, we, we have a lot of the tools that we need now to address this pandemic. We have these vaccines that are really effective and so on, but the challenge now, a, lo a lot of it is communication and listening and understanding each other and things like that. Yeah, so uh, really, <laughs> it all comes down to, uh, to the title of your book, you know, Missing Each Other, How to Cultivate Meaningful Connections. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's what we need right now. Yeah. So I, re I really want to thank you both uh, for being my guest today on Shrink Wrap Radio. Thank you so much for having us. We really appreciate it. We really enjoyed this conversation.